Bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Sorry, I'll only be a minute or two. I'm just sending a text to let the people in the church know uh, that we are going live so they can join if they wish to join. Maybe they don't. <laughs> Who can tell? But uh, pardon me for looking down at my uh, phone here. I hope you're all keeping well. I hope you've all had uh, a nice Easter uh, and a nice Easter Sunday. Mind you, the weather wasn't as good uh, today as it was yesterday, but nevertheless, we do uh, hope that uh, you still had a, a good time and that the Lord was good to you. Uh, so, this is my last one, and then we're ready to go. I'll just send that through, and it's all gone, so... Anyway... Uh, Good to have you with it, with us tonight. What we're going to do here is just... Well, I'll take that down. That's me. Good to see us all. So just... We're going to... Uh, well, preach probably is a proper word, isn't it? So let's say sure. Because sometimes preaching, people think you're going to ram something down their throat, don't they? But I'm, I'm, I'm just going to pray the Holy Spirit draw you to Christ. That's uh, more important. Uh, so I'm up here on the uh, study, study on radio room, you know, microphones and everything in here. Uh, but uh, well, what I want to like to do first and foremost is pray. Good to see the Prime Minister. I'm sure you've seen us broadcast home. Well done to the NHS and also the Lord, because a lot of people were praying for him around the world. But really good to see that he's back home. And aren't the NHS and the doctors and nurses we have in this country, also in the UK and Ireland, aren't they wonderful, wonderful people? Wonderful people. That's why I encourage you every Thursday to get out. If you haven't made your out at your door on a Thursday night at 8 o'clock clapping them, then God forgive you. God forgive you. We've been out every Thursday. I'm thankful for them, and I'm sure you are. And we applaud them for what they've, what they've uh, done. And uh, we're going to pray now, okay? We're going to pray, and I'll stop the waffle, and then we'll look at God's word. Father, we do thank you that you are still on the throne, regardless of how it may seem. You're in complete and utter control, Father. Nature hasn't collapsed. The air we breathe is still there. The sun is still shining. And the planetary systems are still intact. You're a great big God, and you hold us in your hand. We do pray uh, this evening for those, Lord, suffering with this terrible virus. We pray that you would touch them and heal them. Breathe into their respiratory system, Father, or their lungs. Drive the virus out of their bodies. Pray for the doctors and the nurses and the frontline workers that you would keep them safe, Father, in what is a very dangerous situation for them. And we pray, Lord, for the families in particular of lost loved ones. And we pray for them. We can't begin to imagine what they're going through. Uh, but we know that you do because you've said in your word you're touched for the very feelings of our infirmities. And you've also said in your word that you would comfort those that mourn. And that's our prayer tonight, Father. We pray your word. You would comfort those that mourn, those who have lost loved ones, Father. And may they know your insurmountable grace at this time. Amen. Praise God. God's good. Well, I'm going to read uh, just a, a few verses from Revelation chapter 5, which is the last book in the Bible and a fascinating book. Uh, a lot of different slants and different interpretations of this book, but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Your Bible might say the revelation of St. John. John's just receiving it, but it's actually the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read in Revelation chapter 5 from uh, verse 1, and this is what John says. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written Within and on the back side, 
sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to even look thereon. And I, John, wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And we know the Lord will bless his word uh, to our hearts. This is John here on the island of Patmos, a little Greek island. And uh, he's receiving revelation from Jesus Christ. And simply what that means, he's seen unfold before his eyes end time events. End time events. John is watching the end time unfold. In one place in Revelation, he actually uses the phrase, I saw... 36 times in 34 verses. I saw John was actually seeing this stuff. He wasn't dreaming it. Someone wasn't just speaking it and he was trying to build up a picture in his mind. John was actually seeing this stuff unfold before his very eyes. When we pick it up here in Revelation chapter 5 verse 1 to 4, we find John at this point overcome by depression and anxiety because he is now unsure how things will actually end. Maybe he's having a doubt or two, who knows? But he's very, very concerned. From John's limited earthly perspective, and we all have a limited early earthly perspective, it seems that destiny itself is hanging in the balance because no one, as it seems, is worthy to open the seals of this scroll of judgment which will in, in fact vindicate the redeemed of all ages. And I believe that's why John's, or one of the reasons, John's heart was so heavy. That's why I, I believe he was filled with anxiety. That's why I believe he was perplexed. Because the redeemed of the Lord, the redeemed of the Lord, those who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's me and maybe a, a lot of you watching uh, 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 tonight, their vindication, our vindication, was depending on someone opening this book, opening this book so the seals would be opened. And, and John is, is, is absolutely uh, besides himself because there is no one, it seems, no one in heaven which is a dominion of God. There's no one in the earth which is a dominion of man. There's no great man any, anywhere here in the earth. There's absolutely none to be seen. And, and, and John is, is, is perplexed at the whole thing. Absolutely perplexed. He doesn't know what to say. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know who to turn to. No one even under the earth, no one under the earth is able or worthy to open this seal. And here we have an, an incredible picture developing before us. An incredible picture developing before us. The veteran, and John is a veteran. Let's that's, that's not make a, uh, uh, any mistake about this. You see, John, this, 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 this apostle, John, has been through a few battles. Anyone here been through a, a few battles? Well, here's, here's some of John's battles. John had, had intense personal persecution. I mean intense personal persecution. He had countless battles with religious leaders. You may have had one or two, but John had countless battles with religious leaders. He had battles with Roman emperors. Wow. And he had a battle with Satan himself. And here 
after all of those battles. I want you to see this so you can see how intense this situation is that John is currently facing. After all of those battles, here we have John himself now reduced to tears. He wasn't reduced to tears when he was uh, fighting with the religious people or the Roman superiors or even Satan himself. But here we have the revelation of Jesus Christ. And at this moment in his life, John himself is reduced to tears because the outcome of the ages is so uncertain. Uncertainty is a painful thing. There are many people today uncertain whether this virus is going to go away. They're uncertain will there ever be an antidote. They're uncertain will there ever be a vaccination. They're uncertain whether they will live or die or will some of their family members live or die. There's so much uncertainty in the earth. And with that uncertainty comes fear and fear grips our hearts and fear cripples our very being. And John is facing this uncertainty. John says, I wept much. If you look at that in the Greek, it says he sobbed and wailed in, in a very loud, intense fashion. The things of God, you see. And it's important that we understand this tonight. It's important that you understand this tonight. It's important that I understand this tonight. That the things of God are often far, often far different from the way they appear to us with our earthly perspective. You know, we, we look at something. And we, we, we perceive what the outcome might be. But that doesn't mean that's how God is looking on the situation. I can tell you with, with, with 100% conviction tonight that God is looking on these nations who are suffering this pandemic through different eyes than you, you or I are looking at it. God is not perplexed by it all. God is not being knocked to and fro, wondering what to do next. That's us, but not our God tonight. Not our God tonight. One of the worshipping elders, it tells us, steps over to John and says, Don't weep. Behold the lion. The lion has prevailed. <laughs> well, thank God for the lion tonight. Thank God for the lion of the tribe of Judah tonight. But John, look, I want you, you need to see this, okay? You need to see this. Listen to the words of the elder. Behold the lion. Behold, John, look, the lion. But John looks, and what does John see? Does John see a lion? No, he doesn't. John sees a lamb. Incredible, isn't it? Jo Revelation 5, 5 to 6. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, to loose the seven seals. Hallelujah! What a great truth from this elder. And then John goes on to say, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. You see that? A lamb, not a lion, a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Now, I want you to hear me tonight, what I'm saying. The problem isn't John's eyesight. Because he's had vision after vision after vision after vision. The problem is not John's eyesight. That's not his problem. The problem is his perspective. Your perspective. You look out at this world today, you might see things spiraling out of control. That's your perspective. That's how you perceive it to be taking place. You understand what I'm saying tonight? The elder says it's a lion of the tribe of Judah. John sees a lamb. That's his perspective. What he sees is correct, by the way. <laughs> what he sees is correct. But what he understands is incorrect. What he understands is incorrect. The one who was willing uh, had his eyes on the problem. Aren't we, aren't we all similar we will because we have the, our eyes on the problem and we fail to turn our eyes or our hope to the solution 
uh, to the problem. While the one who was worshipping has his eyes on the solution. You see, the elder is what? What is the elder? He's a worshipping elder. He's worshipping around the throne of God. And you know, when you worship God, when you're caught into the presence of God during a pandemic, during a catastrophe, during even death itself, you see things somewhat differently to how everyone else sees them or perceives them. The worshipping elder sees a lamb, but he understands something, that this lamb is the lion of Judah. John is not worshipping. John is distressed. He's perplexed and he sees a lamb. He doesn't see past the lamb. It doesn't tell us he sees past the lamb. That's all he sees. It's the lamb. I, I, I want to ask you tonight, and no doubt it, it, that you, 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 would, you would say yes to this. Have you ever felt hopeless, overwhelmed, trapped, or helpless? Maybe that's how you feel now. I have no doubt that's how many people feel now. People in hospitals, people in, in families, people in lockdown, people who, who, who can't see their grandchildren or their, 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 their children. And, and, and we, we are no different in many respects because we have grandchildren we want to hug. Our own daughter Jessica has been, been removed from our home. She's over living with my daughter because I've had COVID-19 and, Mar uh, I've had COVID and Martine's down with the symptoms. We can't take the chance and uh, Martine has been crying because we put Jessica to bed. We get her up in the morning. But 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 but, but are we perplexed? No 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 no. I, I want you to hear this tonight. You see, uh, people get overwhelmed. People feel hopeless. People feel trapped. People feel helpless because they haven't seen the end of the story yet. Uh, they haven't seen the. end. Now I don't know about you. I know who wins because I've read the back of the book. I know who wins. Before you chide the disciples for their unbelief, and we often do, before we berate them for their lack of vision, before we scold them for not hanging around to see the miracle on the first Easter morning, remember that you didn't go through the agony that the disciples went through. We're very judgmental on the disciples. I hear people talking about doubting Thomas. I, I hear people preaching. I've even preached it myself when Jesus was on the cross. The disciples had all taken themselves off. Most of, uh, had, of them had went back to their, their, their own occupation again, but they weren't round the cross. They weren't supporting Jesus. They weren't crying out his name. They were like John, somewhat disillusioned, somewhat uh, disappointed. Their perspective was all wrong. They were focusing on a dying Christ on the cross. If they had been worshipping, you know what they would have seen? They would have seen a resurrected Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They would have seen a rest. But let's not berate, berate them tonight. Let's not be, be, be too hard on them tonight, you see, <laughs> for their unbelief. <laughs> Uh, you, you weren't there on Friday, you see. I wasn't there on Friday when Jesus died. They didn't have an inspiring drama. They didn't have a stirring concert. They didn't have a beautiful sunrise service to attend. They didn't have a worship team. They didn't have elders to comfort them. They didn't have a church they could, could, could run to. They didn't have a Bible they could, could open. They didn't have a prophet who, who could, could speak and tell them everything's going to be all right, guys. Don't worry you see for these for these disciples on good friday there had never been an easter sunday hallelujah thank god for thank god for us today this is easter sunday this is resurrection sunday but for these disciples there had never been a resurrection sunday and they wonder they were frightened only a friday and that was far far from good it was a bad day it was a bad day they had been with Jesus at the Last Supper as he spoke mysteriously of, of, of one who would betray him and, and struck fear into their hearts as they asked, Is it I? Am I the one, Lord, that will betray you? They'd been with him in the garden as he prayed in agony for so long that, that they finally fell asleep from exhaustion. 
Uh, they were there when Judas came to betray him and they realized the, the horror of what his earlier words really meant. They tried to defend him, but who could stand against a Roman legion? Who could stand? They felt a burst of hope when Jesus said, can you imagine how you must have felt when Jesus said, I can pray now to my father and he will give me 12 legions of angels. Maybe the disciples, you ever thought about this? Maybe the disciples that moment thought, go for it, Lord, go for it. Bring them down. Let's wipe this Roman legion out. Jesus said he could have done it, but he didn't. He didn't. They heard with everyone else. The fabricated evidence and the outright lies that were made against their Messiah. And their hearts sunk. Their hearts sunk at the resounding verdict of guilty that echoed from each trial. Uh, before Annas the high priest in John 18. Before Caiaphas in Matthew 26. Before the Sanhedrin in Matthew 26. Before Pilate in Matthew 27. Before Herod in Luke 23. And then again before Pilate again in Luke 23. They had seen Jesus scourged. They watched it. They witnessed it until he could no longer stand under his own power. His, his skin as it were literally Ripped off in huge gaping patches. They had seen the makeshift crown of thorns pressed into his scalp until his face was dripping with blood. They had seen him slapped, uh, pum plum pummeled and punched until his uh, countenance was uh, permanently marred and he seemed only a grotesque character of a, of a man. They had hope beyond hope. Hope beyond hope. That when Jesus was taken before the crowds, that the nightmare would be finally over when the evidence was produced. Surely the thousands he had taught, surely the hundreds that he had healed would stand up for him and speak out for him to convince the Romans that he was harmless to their emperor. But we don't see one. We don't see a blind man here. We don't see the deaf. We don't see the dumb. We don't see Jairus standing here crying out and as, as a defense for Jesus. After his daughter was raised from the dead. We don't see Lazarus shouting out. He's an innocent man. We don't see anyone who was saved. We don't see Zacchaeus. We don't see anyone crying out. Leave him alone. He's a harmless individual. He just went about doing good. Not one person. Not one person. Spoke out in his support. And with a growing horror. The disciples watched them all. Under the evil influence of the Sanhedrin. And they were an evil bunch of people. A lot of religious people like the Sanhedrin today you know. They turn the convicted murderer loose. And scream to, to, towards Jesus crucify him. Until Pilate is pressured. Who was a spineless weak individual to act. They watched. Engulfed by the angry mob. Scared for their lives. As Jesus was nailed to the cross and hoisted up into the air, hanging naked and humiliated as he, 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 he shook, as it were, in agony for you and for me. They had watched his laboured breathing and groans of pain. Fully aware that crucifixion was really death by suffocation. They had heard the last cry, it is finished. But all their ears heard was, I am finished. Oh, I want you, I want you to see this, you see. Disciples, maybe a standing afar off, it is finished. Yeah, Jesus said it is finished. Salvation is finished. The price has been paid. But when he breathes his last, I'm telling you, the disciples didn't hear, I'm finished. They heard, we're finished. The one we have put our hope in. The one we have put our faith in. The one we have given up three years of our life and our jobs and left our families for is nigh dead. And we are finished. And it seems dark and it is dark. It's very, very dark. Wow. There, were the, there they were when the Roman... They were there when, probably when the Roman soldier uh, pierced Jesus' rib cage with a spear. And then that verdict was read out, he's dead. 
He's dead. And that unrecognizable body is unfastened from the cross, laid on the ground to be wrapped for burial. They were there in the weeping in the morning and the grieving possession. They carried Jesus to a borrowed tomb. They were there when the huge stone was rolled in place. They had to take that long, long walk home to a life that no longer seemed to exist. I'm telling you, wow. I wouldn't swap what we're going through now for what they went through then. No way. Let me ask you again. Have you ever felt hopeless, overwhelmed, trapped or helpless? That's simply because you haven't seen the end of the story. Heaven's script of the ages is called the mystery of God. In Revelation 10 and 17, the mystery of God. Satan himself cannot understand it. He's also powerless to change it. And he wants to convince you tonight. He wants to convince you that God has left you. That God has abandoned you. That God has abandoned Northern Ireland. That God has abandoned Ireland. That God has abandoned the UK. That God has abandoned Europe. That God has abandoned the world. He wants you to believe that. <laughs> God, you see has given us a key, a key called worship that changes our perspective on heavenly things. We worship him. Satan can't begin to understand why we worship him. Because he lost his keys a long time ago. He lost all access to the purposes of God the moment he rebelled. And he has been frantically trying to bluff his way to victory ever since and failing every step of the way. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 to 10 says this, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen, hallelujah, nor ear heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man. Oh, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. You know, worship, worship is the key that lifts up you up to God's perspective. The higher you rise in worship, the smaller the devil and his kingdom look. When you see things from heaven's perspective, the one opening the scroll which controls the ages is not just a slain lamb, but he's a strong lion. And once John understood this, he could stop weeping. Jesus was not just a lamb slain in Revelation 5. Jesus was not just a lamb that was slain and Calvary. He was the lamb that was slain from the very foundation of the world for you and for me tonight. Revelation 13 and 8, his temporary defeat had always been part of God's plan for ultimate victory and Satan took the bait. After Calvary, I'm telling you, wow, they must have been partying in hell. Satan had his, and his demons had just three days to celebrate as their killing of God's latest prophet before God walked into hell. <laughs> Satan puzzled, no doubt, asking, God, what are you doing here? You said that, that since the fall of man, death, hell and the grave would be my dominion. What are you doing here? Who gave you the authority to even come in here? And God would reply, don't you know, Satan? Don't you know? Are you that stupid? Did you, did you, can you not see? You gave me 
receive authority. The moment you crucified me at Calvary, you give me the authority. Can you see Satan screaming, what do you mean? That was just another prophet named Jesus. God said, no, that was, that was not just another prophet. It was me. It was a God man. Jesus was God on the flesh. That's who died on Calvary. And the moment he died on Calvary and rose again the third day, he, he took the keys from Satan over sin and, and, and won the victory over, over sin, over death and over hell itself. Wow. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Hear, O Israel, Jeremiah, or Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Uh, I'll tell you, Satan realized that now. Jer James 2 and 19, thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. You see, I, I want you to see this tonight. This is important that you see this tonight. I want you to see it. Oh, glory to God. I, 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 are you ready for this? This is, this is an unbelievable truth. <laughs> All Satan did the day he killed the lamb. All he did the day he killed the lamb was to unveil the lion. Oh, hallelujah. You see, the lamb that was sacrificed at Calvary was resurrected as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Maybe John's still looking at Calvary. Maybe John's still looking at the pain. But the worshipping elder. No, no, no. That was a lamb, John. It was a lamb. The lamb of God that died on the cross for your sin and mine. But John, don't you understand something? On the third day he rose again. And he didn't come out of that tomb, John, as a lamb. He came out of that tomb as a lion of the tribe of Judah. Who has prevailed again and again and again and again. And he still prevails for the souls of men. Even in 2020. Glory to God. <laughs> Revelation 1, 17 to 18 says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys. You see this? I have the keys of hell and of death. If Satan doesn't even have the keys to his own kingdom. <laughs> How can he lock me up? How can he lock you up? If he can't even lock his own house up. Jesus Christ. The one who died for you. The one who died for me. The one who loves you more than you will possibly ever fully understand. Has absolute power over physical death and spiritual death. When he said to the thief on the cross in Luke 23 and 43. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. He was speaking of the abode of the dead. It had been under the control of Satan since the garden of Eden. Jesus went through death into the grave. But he came out with the keys to both. Glory to God. <laughs> Psalm 68 and 18 says. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Do you see this? Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. I want you to know this tonight, that Satan has no power other than the power you give him. He has no power other than the power you give him. And I tell you tonight, and I plead with you tonight, and I beg with you tonight, you surrender your life to Jesus. You see, I remember a, a, a good few years ago, and it, it's so true, hearing Raynard Bunky speak, that, that saint of God who's with his Savior as we speak. And he said this, the devil, the devil <laughs> is only a mouse with a microphone. The devil is only a mouse with a microphone. I'm telling you tonight, people, our Savior is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. If you're gripped with fear tonight, it's your perspective. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his glorious face 
and the things of this earth will grow, go dim in the light of his glory and grace. It's all to do with perspective. Don't look at the problem. Don't look at the sin problem. Don't look at the sickness problem. You will be of all men, all women most miserable. Look to the solution. And the solution is Jesus. The solution to the fear that has gripped the earth is Jesus. The solution to the sin problem is Jesus. The, the solution to the sickness problem is Jesus. The broken homes, the broken marriage, uh, the broken lives, the broken people. It's Jesus. We present to you Jesus who is able to save, who is able to keep, who is able to restore, <laughs> and who's able to heal. What is it you want in life tonight? If you, if you don't have Christ, you're not living, you're merely existing. I pray tonight that you would put your trust in Jesus. It's the wisest thing that anyone can do. It is the best decision anyone can make in life. Put your trust in Christ tonight. Ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior and Lord and live your life for Him. Start to worship Him. When you start to worship Him, you will see things differently. You will see things differently. May you be blessed tonight. May you be encouraged tonight. And may you know the Savior tonight. Praise God. Jesus died for you. And Jesus died for me. I love you and the Lord. Appreciate you spending time with me tonight. If there's anything that you need, drop me a message if you want me to pray. Not a problem. If you're a backslider and you want to come back to the Lord, let me know that you've done it. If you're not saved and you've got saved, let me know so I can rejoice with you. You know the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that comes to that place of repentance. May God bless you. May he keep you. May he, he make his face to shine upon you. Keep yourselves safe. Stay indoors. Spend time with God. Worship him and lift up the name of Jesus. God bless you. Good night. Have a good one.